So this is uh, an overview of a, a project that I've been working on for uh, some time now. And um, when you give a talk, you can uh, decide to go into great detail with respect to a particular topic. Uh, and uh, that is often what is demanded uh, uh, within the discipline of uh, philosophy alone, and rightly so. Um, but you can also choose to go more broadly and t try to present an overview of, uh, of a larger project, and that is what I'm doing here. So uh, it is, from a philosophical standpoint, uh, short on argument. Um, so it lacks detail often. Uh, and if you're interested, I hope we can fill in the details. Um, but uh, what it lacks in detail, it has in breadth and, uh, uh, let us say, the, um, the span, uh, the scope of the claims being made. Um, and I, I, I hope it, it hangs together uh, well, and maybe you can help me figure out uh, if, it, if it doesn't. Um, so uh, let me just jump right in. Um, now, uh, you might ask, um, well, uh, this is a project on intergenerational justice, um, where um, I, by the way, understand the term justice to be both uh, an, an, an ontological and a, uh, a normative term, but that will emerge as we go along. So you may ask, why, why do we need to talk about this now? Um, well, you know, every generation has its intergenerational responsibilities, I think, uh, so we are not unique. We, the currently living, are not unique in that respect. Um, but um, I do think that uh, there is something uh, very special about our time when it comes to uh, the kind of power that we now have in affecting future people, uh, very distant future people, so it's both a the, um, the power of the impact and its uh, long-lasting reach that we now have uh, with nuclear weapons and with um, the possibilities of environmental destruction, uh, that, is, uh, that is indeed unique. Uh, so for um, you know, something like uh, uh, 50 to 60 years, uh, human beings have had uh, a power um, that is uh, unprecedented, I think. Um, and it has become uh, not just a question of containing nuclear um, uh, uh, arsenal um, in terms of both its civil and its military uses in preventing uh, large-scale and far-reaching uh, environmental destruction, um, but also um, sort of the slow processes of environmental degradation um, and climate change, uh, uh, and, and um, deforestation and so on. So, uh, and what's also uh, interesting about this uh, um, is that uh, not only do we have um, the power to have these long-term effects, we have increasingly also uh, better and more secure knowledge of these effects. And with this power and with this knowledge, arguably, um, intergenerational justice, uh, justice between present and future generations uh, becomes more pronounced and more urgent and more important for us. Now, um, I like to begin uh, discussions um, uh, with, uh, by, by quoting uh, U.S. President Obama. Um, it's actually not uh, his line. It is from the governor of Washington State and Obama incorporated it into his speech before the United Nations in the fall of 2014. Um, it's always problematic to, to uh, quote um, uh, politicians in, a, uh, in, a academic, in an academic talk, um, you know, uh, because some may like the politician, others don't, uh, and so you get yourself into that kind of mess. And, um, and of course, it may always be that the politician is just posturing, is just uh, talking like this because it will win votes, uh, <laughs> or it's just a maneuver in a strategic game. And there's always the danger of that. But I, I, I nonetheless, I like this. Um, and the reason I do is because it does something that I think is very important for us today, given the, um, uh, the uh, 
uh, intergenerational situation uh, and uh, the responsibilities that we find ourselves in. Because what it does for me is that <clears throat> if you read it right, that is you just, you read it a little bit more than let's say a political pundit would, then it does say um, that we are a unique generation with a unique responsibility. So it says what I just said. Um, but it also inserts us into a long-term chain of generations because it re refers to us as the first and the last generation um, and thereby implies that there are many generations before us and after us. And we have to understand ourselves as at a particular juncture in these generational chains. Uh, and you can, you can flash this out more by talking about climate change. How do we know um, that climate change is taking place and that it is anthropogenic? Uh, for example, ice core drilling is very important to this, so we can model the climate. Ice core drilling takes us back 650,000 years. Um, and uh, some of the knowledge we have about uh, greenhouse effects stem from the last time there was a major greenhouse effect. Uh, what's called the thermal maximum. Uh, does anyone know when that took place? Um, this is, you can't do this by ice core drilling. You have to do uh, rock sedimentation analysis and that takes you back uh, 55 million years ago. Uh, so uh, maybe we wouldn't want to talk about human generations going that far back. Um, but you see that um, if, you, if you parse this out, then uh, you get a picture of um, <clears throat> the necessity of thinking our present time and our generation as having a uh, responsibility um, that is on the one hand unique but also requires that we understand ourselves as only one generation. So there's a sense we're unique but we're only one. Um, that is the task here. And maybe that's new. Maybe that's new. Um, okay. Um, now. So how then do we understand these generational relations? Um, now, if you look at the literature, um, the existing literature on uh, intergenerational justice, uh, then most of it um, is uh, most of what, what I can access. Um, and what I can access is uh, uh, either in uh, German, English, or in French. Um, and uh, I also read Latin and Greek, but that doesn't help. Um, uh, and so um, uh, I have to say that, that that is the literature I'm drawing upon here. So I don't know what there is in, uh, in Chinese, in Japanese, uh, and in the many, many other uh, languages and, and, and cultures. Um, but uh, most of the literature is, in fact, um, uh, on this topic, um, uh, in, uh, it has been written in English. Um, there's quite some interesting and good stuff in French, and there is some stuff in, 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 in German, um, but most of the literature that is explicitly devoted to intergenerational relations is English, and that is reviewed here a little bit. And I think most of it is, um, falls into one of these categories here. Um, and I, all of them are problematic for me, and they all have the same problem for me, uh, and you know, I, I'm going very quickly here, but, so the first is to say, um, oh by the way, this literature emerged mostly in the 1970s, and that was because, not because of climate change or environmental destruction, it was because of the nuclear capabilities. Um, that's uh, the, the, the paradigmatic case in the first literature on intergenerational justice in the 1970s is um, about uh, nuclear waste. So what do we do with nuclear waste? Um, and uh, should we be using, um, uh, uh, for military and civil purposes, uh, 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 nuclear energy? Um, anyway, it's obviously a big question here in, in Japan as well. Um, and uh, so what are we doing to future people by uh, <laughs> using uh, nuclear energy, building nuclear bombs, uh, producing nuclear waste, and so forth? Um, uh, and um, most of the literature, in fact, goes along these, this route. It says, look, the problem of future generations is a pretty difficult problem. So what kind of relation do we have to them? They are non-existent. Uh, can they have rights? Um, how should we think of them? 
um, I mean, they don't exist, right? We don't know exactly what their needs will be, um, and we don't have reciprocity relations with them and so forth. So um, it's pretty difficult to think about. Let's, so what, are, what we should do is we should take our existing well-worked-out theories of justice and extend them so, uh, to future people. So uh, most famously in uh, John Rawls's political liberalism from uh, 1995, he he says that he has developed a, a theory of justice uh, for the domestic and contemporary realm, and now we, uh, we have to extend it uh, to the relations to other nations. That's a problem of extension uh, to other generations, uh, to um, the disabled, um, and to animals. So future generations belong with uh, animals, as it were, as a problem of extension. Right? Um, but well, it's not just him, it's also others who have argued along similar lines. Let's take the kinds of theories we have and see whether we can extend them. Now notice what that means. It means that the theory that you have didn't consider generations and therefore it took human beings to not be generational beings. right? And that shows up in certain places. Now another one is to say that, um, it should say stage here by the way, that's an error. Um, Hiroshi pointed this out to me earlier today. Um, so another one is to say, and I've, I've had debates with uh, some of these people, with both of them actually, I've had debates at conferences, um, uh, and it's, it's actually very hard to get them to, to move away from this. Um, but what they say is, and you know, it's, it's somewhat reasonable, what they say is, look, it's a special problem. Uh, future generations is very difficult to think of. So let us make sure we don't mix in the problem of future people with the problem of contemporaries. And to, to model the problem of future people correctly, we have to get away from everything that makes the relationship to future people impure. We have to model it in its pure state. We want to know why and what do we owe future people, not people with whom we overlap. So let's abstract from overlaps. Let's model the problem as purely as we can. And sort of the most egregious or most illustrated form of that is what they call the time bomb problem. Um, it's very hard for them uh, not to think of it that way because, look, we're trying to isolate um, the relation to future people for its normative moral import, and that's why we have to abstract from all this overlap. Right? Again, what happens is, you, you know, that's, it's, for certain purposes it makes a lot of sense, but what you take the human being to be is a being that lives in the present. Right? So this assumption that you have the stage of, of history, as it were, and generations come on stage whole cloth, they leave and the next one comes. It leaves and the next one comes. That's the assumption. Right? Okay. Or you have the two-theory approach, um, probably uh, Lucas Beyer's approach is most uh, famous for that, it basically says that um, the problem of future people is so specific that it's better to have a separate theory of justice for them, one for contemporaries, one for them. Um, and internally, if you read that, it's very well motivated. But again, it says that justice is such that it isn't intrinsically intergenerational. So, so normativity, justice, the reason why we um, owe one another uh, responsibilities, um, that has nothing to do with generations intrinsically. So goes the claim. Uh, more extreme um, is uh, um, Brian Berry's uh, reading of um, an earlier approach by Rawls uh, in the theory of justice. Um, Rawls has different, you, you know the book, I think, but he has, um, he has sort of three models of how to think about future generations. And the first two he dismisses very quickly within, within one paragraph. But the first one is in fact this idea that um, what we should do to figure out what generations owe one another is that we should um, think of uh, generations as meeting uh, all generations that ever will have lived and ever will live as meeting um, in uh, one room, as it were, at one time. And then they have to talk about um, not knowing what generation they will end up being. They have to talk about um, what 
justice among generations would look like. Right? That kind of I call that the dehistoricizing approach because uh, it takes human beings to not be intrinsically historical beings, not intr that time is not intrinsic to them, uh, and also not um, generational time, about which I will say more in a moment. Um, and uh, in, in Brian Berry, it takes the form of um, where, he has a, where he has a footnote, uh, and uh, I, I really like this, um, where he says, well, but what if at the meeting of these generations, they decided that they couldn't come up with workable, um, agreeable principles of justice, and so decided not to come into being at all, right? So not to live, not to become historical. Beings. And that shows you that you know, something is ontologically not right here. I mean, we're not modeling, we're not thinking of the human being in the right way, uh, that it could decide not to come into existence. Hmm?